Hey everyone, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, Take a Tour, an Introduction to Code Rush, presented by Chief Scientist Developer Tools Mark Miller and Code Rush Technical Evangelist Rory Becker. In this webinar, Mark Miller and Rory Becker will provide an overview and introduction to Code Rush. This tour will help you as you move through your trial evaluation to discover this powerful productivity tool from the ground up. Today they'll introduce templates, markers, selection tools, navigation tools, auto-declare, refactoring, the color picker, and code issues. Now before we get started, DevExpress would love to know a little bit more about all of you joining us today, so we have a couple of poll questions for you. The first one is, where did you hear about Code Rush? You can select one or more of the following answers, ads, conferences, websites, a coworker, or a review. If you wouldn't mind just giving us your quick response on that poll, we really appreciate it. All right, so it looks about 36% website, 46% website, 29% coworker, 25% review, great. Thank you so much for voting. And then I have one more question for you really quick. Uh, before we get started, just to help Mark and Rory, um, how familiar are you with Code Rush? Unfamiliar, somewhat familiar, or very familiar? So again, if you wouldn't mind just popping in your question really quick there, it can help Mark and Rory kind of uh, determine where our audience is at today. All right, perfect. So about 44% are somewhat familiar, 33% unfamiliar, and 21% very familiar. Perfect. Thank you so much for your feedback. It's extremely valuable to us. And now I will hand things over to Mark Miller and Rory Becker. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, thanks, Rory, for being here. Rory, as you will hear in a moment, is uh, from the UK, and he's got an appropriate uh, UK accent. Rory, you want to say hi real quickly? <laughs> hey, guys. How's everything going? All right, good. That's, that's awesome. Normally, we do a little more banter, but we have 30 minutes. So um, my goal here in the 30 minutes is to, to give you as many vectors pointing into power of code rush that you can go then follow up maybe do a little more research if you want to learn more just give you a, a peek into what you can do where you can go um, I've only got 30 minutes so we're going to go quickly if you're watching this uh, later on after the recording time uh, you might uh, you have the benefit of being able to pause um, there will be times when there's information on screen that's very useful if you're watching this live you have the ability to just do a quick uh, uh, screen capture and paste it into a paint program. You might want to do that as well. Um, you'll see comments like this that will have information that will come up. And again, because of limited time, uh, I may not be able to get to all the details that are on screen. Um, additionally, this is, if this is a real content-rich pre presentation, as I speak, Rory will sometimes be pasting uh, links into the chat window that you will see um, that Indeed. will give you opportunity to find more information on those particular topics. Topics we're going to discuss are listed in front of you right here on my screen. Uh, the first one I have here is auto declare. Um, by the way, I'm going to be using some templates to generate code really uh, very quickly. I won't explain templates till later on. That's the fourth main topic in here. Uh, just when you see a lot of code just burst out, realize I'm using Coverage templates, which are like uh, Visual Studio snippets on steroids. All right, so let's go in here. We're going to start by just writing some code. Uh, or just starting with the, uh, from a point where code doesn't yet compile. So I have some code here where I've got uh, uh, some local variables and I'm assigning them values. Then I create a new hero which doesn't exist yet. And, uh, and then I assign a, to a property on hero a weakness property. I assign an enum element called element.kryptonite. That element enum is also referenced down here, element.hydrogen, element.oxygen. I also assign to a property called sidekick on hero uh, more uh, a new instance of mortal. So none of this exists yet. None of this code compiles. And so we're going to use the code rush uh, deep declare feature. Uh, and I'm going to hit the code rush key, which is control plus the uh, the back tick. And I'll give you you'll see this again later. And I'll I'll choose uh, this item here. This is declare class with properties. I'll do that. Code rush now takes me away up here to the declaration of a new class called mortal. I'm going to change the name of this uh, mortal to just simply uh, I'm going to name of the property to simply name. Uh, the parameter rather name and now notice that it's also updated it's got a property called name as well now um, I can whatever I type here changes in the other locations as well so I'm initializing a class called mortal with a property called a name I'm going to hit enter on that I'll hit escape to get back to where I was there I'm going to hit escape one more time to go to another marker that I dropped here on element remember that elements being used in several places I'll hit that same key again uh, the code rush key 
I'll choose this time declare enum. And now it scanned the code and found all of those references to the enum elements, built the enum for me automatically. Uh, I can make changes here as I want. When I'm done, I can press escape to get back. And then I'm back here inside of the code. The last piece that's undeclared is hero. Let's go in here. We'll choose declare class with properties. And we're just using the declaration features of the product. I'm going to come in here and hero name. Instead of passing in hero name, I want to just pass in name. So I'll just delete that and then have the same kind of uh, the same kind of change you saw is up in Mortal. So Mortal has a property called name, and Hero has a property called name. And that's it. I make those changes. I press Escape to go back, and now I have code that compiles. Uh, very few keystrokes. This is great for test-driven development. It's great for uh, consume-first development. If you want to write some, the consumption code first, then you can press a single key, uh, choose the item that you want to declare, and then declare it. So that is auto-declare. Next, let's talk about refactoring a bit. For example, I have this block of code right here um, where I check to see if the hero's weakness is going to be found in water, hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, let's say I want to extract that into its own method. So I can select that block of code, hit that same code rush key again, and, uh, and choose, for example, extract method. So let's do that. And so now we're, we're, it's asking us where we want to put that, and uh, I just press enter to put it right there. Uh, and so here's the water check method right here inside of the class called program that we're in, passing in the hero object. Let's undo that a minute. We'll go back and we'll do another refactoring on this. And this time instead of choosing extract method, we'll choose extract method to hero. And in this case, it's going to actually take the method and move it to the hero class instead of the program class that we're in. So we'll do that, extract method to hero. And again, we have the same target picker that we saw before. I, I, I moved over this very quickly, and, and I apologize for that, but here I'll slow down and show it to you. This line shows me where the code is going to be inserted. Uh, over here, I can, I, I've got a little uh, shortcut tab here that tells me if I press the up arrow key, I'll move the target picker up, and if I hit the down key, it'll move it down. If I press enter, I'll declare the method at this location. So I can just use the up and down arrow keys to select the location where I want to put the method, hit enter, and now I have this method called water check, and notice how it changed the code. Before it said hero.weakness, and now it simply says weakness, and I've extracted that code from it out there. Um, let's talk about, let me, do, let me do one other thing. I want to take kind of a, a small uh, commercial break here for a second. When I say commercial break, don't worry, it's not marketing, but it's, I want to talk about that code rush refactor menu that we've seen um, so far. So let's just talk about it. We'll talk about it right here. I'm just going to uh, use another template to just create some, uh, some sample code. And here I have a method that accepts a list of numbers inside of it. And the method is called find first greater than. And it takes that numbered list and some minimum value. It does a for each on it. And it checks to see if that, if the, that int value is greater than a, some min value. And then it returns it. And if it doesn't find it, it throws a new exception. So we're going to talk about that refactor code menu. Now we invoke it with control backtick. That was the key I said before. You can change that in DevExpress options IDE shortcuts. So if you go into DevExpress menu, options, and navigate to the IDE shortcuts page, you can change this if you want to. Um, Rory, I think, has a link probably around this time that talks about how to change shortcuts, is my guess. And if not, you'll see it in a few minutes. Um, also, preview hinting shows what will happen. And so let's look at this again. Let's go back up to that for each loop right up there. And let's hit the code rush refactor key. And you can see here that I have under the refactor menu a refactoring called for each to four. So it takes the for each loop and turns it into a for loop. That's a refactoring. It's not going to change behavior. So I can go ahead and choose that. And there we can see the change. Um, if I hit the refactoring key again, the code rush refactor key again, I have option again to go back to a for each loop, from a for to a for each loop, but I can also, down in the, the code menu, I can reverse the for loop. And that's what it says down here below. It says refactor items in red will, will preserve behavior, and code items in blue can either fix broken code, we've seen that before with auto declare, and they may change program behavior. So for example, in this case, reversing the for loop, if we do that, then this method really becomes find the, the last one greater than greater than that value. So we can change behavior, 
and we can preserve behavior depending on which group of items we choose from. Okay? Like that. All right. Times of total of about all of these three factors. We have over 200 of them, which we couldn't obviously show on a single menu, but they're very, very context sensitive. You'll only ever be shown things that are sensible based on where you're carrying what you're doing just at this exact moment. Right. So, so Roy's just said, hey, there are over, uh, over 200 refactorings shipping, but you only see the ones that matter. Okay, so let's go back, and we're back here, and we're talking about refactoring, and I might want to change this string right here. I might want to say, stay away from the water, uh, Clark, for example, like that. Stay away from the water, Clark. Well, this is inside the hero class, and hero is just got a name property and an alias property. Clark is, would be the alias for Superman, but doesn't make sense for every single one. So what I really want to do is be smarter about this. So I can start with a string like this, select a piece I want to pull out and make it turn essentially into a, a format item, a variable, and I can hit the, the coder's refactor key and choose introduce format item. And then now with this piece selected, I can simply just type in alias, like that. And now I have a nice format string. I might also, this is a little bit of a bonus here, I wasn't planning to talk about that, but I might also do this. Uh, uh, note the time, like that and I'll just put the word time in here as a placeholder. I'll select it, introduce a format item there, and then I'll just use a template called DTN for date, type, na date time now. And now I'm passing in a date time now in this location right here. If I put the caret on this one right here, I have an option called format item. When I choose that, I've got options for formatting the date and time. And I might say, well, I just want a short time, for example, like that, and see what the preview is. Click OK. So I've got refactorings all over the place. There are more than 200 of them. We're approaching 300 here sometime in the future. And, uh, and if you, the essence of Code Rush is this. If you want to do something that normally you'd have to type a lot of code to do, or you'd have to go research something, like for example this, Code Rush has it for you already built in. That's essentially the rule of Code Rush. So let's hit Escape to go back. So that's a little bit about refactoring and about declaring code providers. Um, let's talk about code issues for a minute. Let's go in to, uh, in fact, for, for Mortal, let's come in here and let's do an implement iDisposable on this is what we'll do. So we'll implement iDisposable on, on Mortal and let's come down and see how that will impact things. Let's come down here for the, uh, the Mortal as well. Let's come in here, let's create backing store for Mortal on this location. And now notice what's happened up with Hero. So all these places in the code where you see these squiggly underlines, these are Code Rush code issues. And they're suggestions for how you can improve the code, for example. Here, it shows that this method doesn't rely upon any uh, instant members, uh, so we can simply make this member static. Up here for Hero, it says, well, we can move the type to a separate file. Okay, let's do that. We'll move it over to a separate file. Now we have Hero in a separate file. Still have an issue. It says class should implement iDisposable. Well, let's go ahead and implement iDisposable. And then we'll go ahead and put it right there. And now take a look at what it's built inside of the dispose method right here. If sidekick is not null, call sidekick dispose. Because sidekick implements iDisposable. So that's an example of the code issues. Code issues uh, are underlined or create those squiggly underlines in the code. You can hover over them if you want to. You can also move up and down through the code. You can also spot them off to the side and fix them here as well. Right? Property can be auto-implemented, for example, because there's no side effect code inside the giver or the setter. So you can do those kinds of things. Okay. I feel like I'm rocking through this so fast, Rory. Um, it's somewhat exciting, but I also want, you know, I want to remind everybody that when we finish, we are totally open to questions and, and slower exploration. Um, the next thing I want to talk Absolutely, about... Absolutely, yeah. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, code rush templates. And to talk about code rush templates, I first want to get a multi-line comment here so I can kind of work in it. And uh, to get a multi-line comment, comment, I just do two dots in the space bar like that. And it expands out to this. So if you ever need a multi-line comment, it's a very fast way to do it. I'm just going to work inside of this for a little bit. I've got some templates I've created to talk about templates. 
So for example, you've got some simple templates here. In fact, let's do this. Let's go over to Hero while we do this. Let's uh, create a new vertical tab group over here. So Hero's on one side, and uh, my notes are on the other side. So here we've got simple templates. T goes to true, F goes to false, and N goes, goes to null, or in VB it goes to nothing. Well, let's give it a shot and see what happens over here. So if I say, like, uh, for example, if I said, if I were to create a, um, if I were to be right here and I wanted to return true, I would type in T like that and hit the space bar. And then hit an F and hit the space bar to get false, and then the space bar to get null. Okay. So to do that, we'll go back to, to uh, returning uh, just side click. All right. Likewise, there are, more, there are other examples as well. C can give me a class. So let's look at that. Where would I want a class? Well, I would I put a class inside of a namespace, so I can hit the letter C in the space bar to expand it. And there's my class. I could also be inside of a class as well. And I could hit the letter C and hit the space bar. So for example, here, and do it. But if I'm inside a method, and I just want to work with a variable called C, I hit the space bar, nothing happens. Right? So templates are case are context sensitive. Another example, TF for try finally. So we can come over here, type in uh, TF right here, for example. That gives us a nice try finally block. These, uh, these blue triangles are markers. Uh, if I hit escape, it'll move the carrot to that location and jump right to it. So I can move very quickly into that finally block if I want to. Okay. The other thing TF expands to is a test fixture. So for example, if I'm outside of a, of a method and I type in TF and I hit the space bar, uh, I have a test fixture. Now it's, it says here it's added up at the top. You can see it's added using nunit.framework. Um, that's because I have nunit framework reference in here already. If I had a different test framework reference, it would bring in a different uh, framework. It would specify the right framework for me and bring that in. So that is, um, that's pretty cool. So uh, it would also give you a totally test different framework. syntax if your other framework required that. Yes, exactly. It would give you a different framework as well, right? So that's the simple templates. The next thing I want to talk about are dynamic templates. So dynamic templates work like this. If you want to declare a method, use the letter M. If you want to declare a property, use the letter P. And we can see that over here. So if I'm here, I want to declare a method, just letter M, space bar, gives me a new method. I want to declare a property, P, space bar, it gives me a new property, declaration. Okay? And it's also given me a property name, which is uh, right here. It put it with the other uh, fields. So I found the private mortal field and put it right in there in the same location. Let me undo that, and so it goes away. And let's keep looking at what we have here. If I want to declare a variable, I use the letter V. So V is used for fields, for locals, or for parameters. So it's pretty simple, right, Rory? If I want a method, letter M, a property P, variable V, I use the first letter of the thing I want. Now the power yeah. comes is, is when we combine it with a shortcut to the type we want. So if we want a type of integer, we use the letter I. If we want a, let, a string, we use the letter S. And if we want a Boolean, we use the letter B. So as a quick example, we'll come over here and we'll type in MB, and we'll get a method that returns a boolean. Okay, so if we full, if we take that logic and we follow it out to create a method, a property, or a variable that returns one of these types that we've learned already, there's MB. We saw a method returns a method uh, a boolean. MS gives us a method that returns a string. We could type these out right here. If you have coders installed right now, as you're watching this. I recommend you try these. They're going to build that muscle memory. And you'll see that it's much faster, much quicker to declare the methods. Now, when you declare a method, by the way, you'll see that the scope defaults to private. If you want to make that public, you can use alt plus up or down to cycle the visibility. So, And I can do that from anywhere inside that method. And as I do that, you'll see a little arrow that says, here's what's happening. Your visibility is changing. Okay? Okay. All right. So that's methods, that's properties, that's variables. Notice at the end I have dot, dot, dot. Any type that you want to work with, uh, you can create an abbreviation for, or we already have one. We already have a shortcut. 
And you can see them by going into the DevExpress tool windows and bringing up the Code Rush tool window. So let's bring Hero back over here. And we'll look at this. As we move around in the code, the Code Rush training window changes to tell me what I can do. So here, for example, C gives me a class. We saw that. S gives me a struct, and I gives me an interface. Just type that letter. If I want an interface, I, space bar, I've got my interface name. Give it what I want. Give it the name I want. I call it, whatever that's going to be, and then declare some method for it, whatever I want to do here. Method would be the letter M, P, properties. The template expands differently depending on where I am. So if I type in MB here, that gives me a method that returns a Boolean, and I just fill it out. If I'm here and I type in MB, I get a method that returns a Boolean, and I fill it out. Now, I've been kind of just, just skipping by these fairly quickly, but see this orange block right here? This orange block is a field. And if I hit Enter on the field, I will go to the next field, which is right here, marked in orange. So, for example, I can type in my method name here, like, uh, like swim, for example, hit Enter, and then pass in any parameters. Well, a parameter is a variable, right? It's a, it's, it's, so I use the letter V. If I want to pass in a, a distance, for example, I would pass in V for, for variable, and then a distance might be a decimal, it might be a double, whatever I want. I can just type in, like, for example, D for double, and then look over to the left, and I see that VD is going to give me a variable of type double, and there I can see what it looks like. I could also use VDE to give one of decimal. If I don't want that, if I want it something different, like, for example, uh, uh, short, for example, I can type in VS, and I say, well, short is VSH. So the, the training window shows me what keys I need to press to get the type I want, and, and, then, and then at this point I'm in a field again, type in the name of that, I call this distance, hit enter, and I can hit enter one more time, and I'll get inside the method, and I'm ready to work. What's so cool about this is that I'm not using the up and down arrow keys. I'm not using the end key. I'm just hitting enter to get from place to place to place. CodeRush is the most efficient, most powerful tool for writing code quickly. In fact, we so, often get... I'm sorry, Roy, do you want to say something? I was just going to summarize because the, the template basically is, is generating a lot of code for you. It's saving you loads of keystrokes. You're not having to the shift key. There's no accidental shifted anything, apart from maybe capital letters, which would be used to anyway. So there's no braces that you have to manually type. There's no curly braces. You don't have to remember to navigate to the right location. All of that standard setup is produced for you. The st same standard things, properties and methods, they're all the same all the time. A few minor changes here and there, but you get to customize and concentrate on the business logic, the actual code that needs writing, not the tiny things that you could get make mistakes on. Codress helps you out with that boilerplate code. It does. In fact, it gets to the point where you can prototype on the fly. So if you're in a, in, a, in a meeting with somebody and they're talking about ideas, you can actually write the code while you're talking about it. Or if you're a speaker and you're in a session presenting and somebody asks a question, you can actually write the code as they're talking about it, right? All right, so let's go to, let's next go to navigation and selection tools. We will talk about that next. So, um, so there's, uh, a couple things here I want to talk about. Let's first talk about camel case navigation. So I'm going to uh, expand a template to help me uh, give me some sample code here. Camel case navigation, I use Alt plus left or Alt plus right, and I can also combine with the shift key to select. And it works well with the rename refactoring. And so I've got some sample code I've written here called, uh, here's, a, here's a method called start the awesome car remotely, and it's in a class called car and another class called owner, which creates a new instance of a, of a car in, in a field, and then calls uh, start the awesome car remotely. So that's what's going on. So let's say I wanted to change the name of this method. Let's say I wanted to make it the super awesome car remotely. So to get to that point where I want to write the word super, I just hold the alt key down, left and right arrow keys, and see how it takes me to those, that, those uppercase characters right, between a right in front of a lower, right after a lowercase character. So I can get right there very quickly, hit the F2 key to rename, type in super, and I'm done. And that's it. I've, I've renamed that very quickly. Or let's take a more realistic example of this, and let's again come in here. Let's say I want to remove this, the super awesome car because we're already in the car class, and I just select the piece I want using alt and the shift key, alt, left, 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 and now hit F2 to rename, delete key, and I very quickly made a change everywhere. So, camel so this case, feature, 
plays on two very specific things which everybody's used to doing already. There's a control left and right, which is native in Windows, which will go from word to word to word. You'll have used it when you're editing documents all over the place. You maybe even use it when you're writing code now. So you sw quickly switch. Instead of using control left and right, you're using alt left and right. And now we've got a more fine-grained version of the same thing, jumping between word boundaries. And of course, we're all using those word boundaries in our method names and in our variable names because it helps the readability in the first place. It makes it easier for us to see what's going on. Um, so we, we're working on on skills you already have, and we're just giving you a, a, a more ability to to rely on those in other circumstances. Okay, so Sorry. so next we'll talk about selection embedding. We have some shortcuts right here. We have B for braces, C for try catch, F for try finally, and T for try finally catch. And also with parens, you can just hit the uh, the paren key like Shift Nine on my US keyboard. So if we look at that, we can come into let's find some code. Let's say uh, we want to well, we want to protect here against some exception. I suppose we'll. Uh, I don't have a great non-contrived example, but we'll just take this. Let's say we want to uh, protect against an exception. So I select that block. By the way, off to the left in the coder's training window, we get some of those same keys. So I can type in C for try catch, and now it wraps that in a try catch block. It puts a marker for me right here. I hit escape, and I'm now down inside uh, the code, ready to ready to write it. So there is a selection embedding. Next, I want to talk about uh, tab to next reference. So we'll come in right here. So tab to next reference. It's a cool navigation feature. You just hit the tab key or shift tab when the caret is on an identifier. So here, for example, I'm on the hero reference. I hit the tab key. I can jump to every other single reference inside of the code. Okay. Of course, this so plays on another very easily, um, sorry. <laughs> Another very fine-grained, um, built-in kind of thing we're used to in Windows. You're used to tabbing between text boxes and other things that have focus on a normal desktop screen. This time, you're just applying that knowledge back to something else that you're used to doing all the time. This time, code. So every reference to something in particular. Well, this works with any reference you've got. We're using here, here, but you could use string. You could use a class you've invented. Pretty much works everywhere. Yes. Next, next, next navigation feature, quick nav. Press Control-Shift-Q, and it works with selections, too. So I'll show you the selection second. Control Shift Q. This is going to show me everything in here. I can try. I can type in Hero, for example. I can see the references to Hero. I can uh, type in. Do I have that swim method? I don't have swim method anymore. Um, I have a start method though. Start remotely. Pro tip is hold the control key down, and you can see a preview of the location before you jump to it. So if you want to jump to it, you can. Uh, otherwise, you just hit. You can just hit escape, and you're back to where you started. Codebrush restores that view back there for you. Um, uh, I also want to talk about markers quickly. I'll just bring those up right here. So whenever a code rush action takes you away from where you are, and we've seen that several times, right? I bring up the menu, I choose something, I select a target location, and now I'm away from where I started, a marker is dropped. And it looks like that, that little blue triangle between the parents. All I do is press escape to get back. I can also drop them manually with alt home, and I, and I can also swap with alt shift home. So that you can try that piece out right there. One final thing there, Mark. We've also enhanced one of the built-in features of Studio. F12 will get you to the declaration of something that you're referencing at the moment. We'll drop a marker before you leave your current location so that when you do go to that declaration, you can hit escape to come straight back to where you started. It allows you to right. drill into code multiple levels and come back up the way you came, like a series of breadcrumbs. So I can do that. I've rebound to F12 to a different keystroke. And, but you can do that. You can dive in like that, hit escape to get back to where you started. So it's very nice to drill in and dr coming back in, coming back out. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the color picker. And so working with color, CL is the shortcut. And uh, one other powerful, we saw a V and we saw M and P. One other powerful one is N for new instances. So if I type in the shortcut N followed by the shortcut CL for color, it adds system drawing. And that's, again, because what, a, what I had out here, system drawing, if you're using something else with color in it, you get that. I can pass in, I can create uh, a new uh, declaration. So it creates a variable declaration that's initialized. Come over here to color empty. Let's change it from color empty to color crimson, for example. Coderash puts a color swatch here for you. You can click the color swatch, bring up the color picker, uh, and you can now select the color that you want. Um, normally you see it uh, like this by hues, but you can also isolate any one of these on this line here. You can isolate saturation, for example, make something more saturated, make something less saturated. Just control one particular aspect. Um, brightness, again, you can do the same thing with brightness, control to stat. You can even control red, green, or blue, for example. 
So this is this is probably one of the most full featured color pickers you would ever get. It rivals color pickers in professional color uh, image applications, and it's inside Code Rush. And the cool thing about it is once I select that color that I want, whatever that color is, and I can also, by the way, update opacity. I just click OK. And there it is, it writes the code for me right there and gives the color, updates the color swatch for me as well. The web colors, named colors, you can see all the named colors. I can sort them by hue, by saturation, by lightness. Um, system colors are available to me as well. Document colors, so all the color references within the particular file I'm looking at. And I can also go in and I can pick a particular set of uh, color palette as well, whatever I want. The color picker is very powerful. So there's what several benefits it? to this. You've, you've got the ability to um, put a CSS file, as you say, and to see all the colors that are in use at a glance and actually get a feel for the palette. You can come into the picker itself and get a feel for all those colors right next to each other in nice big blocks where you can compare and contrast them. The picker we've got works everywhere you see color, everywhere where it's written down, C Sharp, VB, XAML, CSS, HTML. All these places use exactly the same techniques, but the color picker knows how to put the right kind of code back where it came from. Studio doesn't have this now, and I don't believe it even has it in VS11 coming up. They're very proud of their CSS color picker, but support. Cool. And so, so that's it. That's our 30-minute, action-packed, fast-paced introduction into Code Rush features. Um, I, I want to open it up into to questions right now. We saw auto declare. We saw refactoring. We saw code issues, templates, navigation and selection tools and we saw the color picker. This is the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Um, if you, the more you dive into Code Rush, the more you're going to, features you're going to learn that are going to make you faster. They're going to actually make up, you know, there's going to be a return on investment in your own time. So you, you spend an hour to learn about Code Rush, you'll make up that hour in a week. And after that, you're just coding faster, coding faster. Hopefully this, got, this, is, this is helpful and useful to people. Uh, do we have questions, Rory? Uh, there's no questions waiting just at the moment. If, if anybody wants to ask any, feel free. There should be a little window there associated with uh, Ghost Webinar. You just type your question in there. We will get through and uh, answer it as soon as we can. Uh, in the meantime, I will point out that we're also quite happy to ask, answer questions on Twitter as well. In fact, any way you can get hold of us, we will answer. We have a great support center with wonderful support staff waiting to not just have any bugs reported and feature suggestions. We will happily answer questions on there as well. So basically, you get in contact with us. We would love to fill you in on as many details of this as you can. And if you want to suggest new features, we're all up for that as well. We have a large repository uh, where we can store any of those, and uh, we'll come back to you with you know a proper conversation uh, on exactly how you think this should be implemented. We have a question now from Steve McKenzie. Um, he's asked, did we show how to create your own templates? We didn't cover that in this particular um, webinar, Stephen. Um, this is just the quickest overview that we could possibly do. 30 minutes is barely enough time to, as, as Mark says, to scratch the, uh, the iceberg. Um, but every template you've seen us use, every single one of them, they are mere configuration of template engine. You can create any of those yourselves. You can adjust them the way you want. Uh, many of them already respond to settings. but Again, template creation is a matter of just putting the right text in the right place. I will um, see if I can't find a link to the creation of templates. I have a blog post on that. I'll see if I can pop that in the chat. Yeah, we have both a blog post and we have a, uh, a, a video. And we have, I think, both an introductory template video and an, and an advanced template video. Templates are very, very powerful. You can do things like set up links and fields. Uh, all very easily, and uh, and so if you want to create your own templates, you can certainly do that. And I just wanted to let um, everyone that's attending know that this is just the first webinar of a three-part series to help you evaluate and master this uh, product, Code Rush. Um, you can visit devexpress.com slash webinars to register for those uh, next two webinars, which is uh, Thursday, April 12th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, increasing productivity with Code Rush. Uh, see how using Code Rush along with Visual Studio can take your productivity to new levels. Uh, Mark and Rory will show advanced refactorings, Deep Declare, the unit test runner, features for ASP.NET, HTML, MVC, Razor, and WPF Silverlight developers, plus duplicate code consolidation. So that's coming up Thursday, April 12th, and it's the second part of the series. And then there is a third webinar, Getting the Most from Your Code Rush Investment on April 26th at 12 p.m. Learn how to move from being a basic user of Code Rush to experiencing more advanced functionality and benefits. Uh, of course, learn directly from the engineers who build Code Rush. Uh, they'll show how to configure Code Rush to wrap around the way you work. 
You'll also build templates, create shortcut bindings, work with context, create selection embeddings, and build a plugin. So those are coming up. If you're hungry for more uh, Code Rush and for Mark and Rory to get a little bit deeper into the product. Okay. Just whilst Amanda was uh, giving all that information out, we have been adding uh, links to various uh, function groups that we've been mentioning as we've gone through this uh, as quick as we possibly can. Um, that you'll find them all in the chat window there. And I've just added a link to the blog post on template creation, which is getting just the tip of the iceberg again on how to create those. But then once you're more comfortable that, you can find your way through the list of templates yourself and discover all kinds of new ways of creating things. Roy, thank you so much. Amanda, no thank trouble. you so much. Uh, yeah, so this is the beginning. We'll go ahead and shut it down. And uh, but if you have questions, more questions on that, you can. Uh, did you? By the way, actually, Roy, did you put the link for the more resources page? To that one I haven't yet, but I will. I'll throw that out there just now. Throw that. Throw that one out there. And um, and and does that include our Twitter addresses in there? Maybe I should write. I them believe it does. I believe it well, does. Actually, if you just put the word Code Rush in your tweet, Rory and I will both see it, and uh, so will other members of the dev team. Just put the word Code Rush in your tweet, and we will see it, and we will respond to you. Awesome. And just before we go to everybody, I just had, we had one more poll question about just trying to see how helpful this session was for you, and here it is. Uh, like I said, how helpful was this session in assisting you with your evaluation of Code Rush? Uh, just give us a quick answer before we wrap this up. Not helpful, somewhat helpful, or very helpful. Great. I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see there's no not helpful. We're about 77% very helpful and 23% somewhat helpful. So thanks for your feedback. Um, all right, Mark, Rory, anything else before we wrap it up? I was just going to say, follow up with this on Twitter. Um, you can, uh, it's, yeah. it's a great, the best place to get the get almost instantaneous answers to your coderish questions. We, we obsess said, about this. We love the questions. <laughs> we will we will do anything to get the answer to your question. We really will. Yeah. So just plague it. us with them. We don't mind. Yeah, we're pretty much friendless, Roy and I. We just <laughs> we're kept ask, in the ask We need the company. Yeah, we're kept in separate, isolated DevExpress dungeon cells, and we're not only allowed out for conferences. So, yeah. All right, so that's it. Thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time.